Welcome to Modern Word Ministries. I'm Deacon Tom Moore, and on behalf of my wife Kim and myself, we want to welcome you. And just to let you know that whether you're here in person or you're tuning in on social media, we appreciate that you have chosen to spend a little bit of your day with us. Before we get to this week's message, just a couple of quick things I'd like to cover. You know, we have an amazing website, and everything you want to do with us and we want to do with you can be found there. You can get on our prayer list on the website, you can do your tithes and offerings over the website, or you can communicate with us. I love feedback, my wife loves feedback. Tell us how we're doing, tell us what you need, tell us what you're looking for in your church, because this is your church. I shepherd this church, but it's your church. So before we start with the message, just a couple of things. First, if you're in need of prayer, or if you know someone who's in need of prayer, go to our website at modernwordministries.org and put in a prayer request. It's very simple to follow. We will get back to you within 48 hours. It's all anonymous. It's confidential. And we will get back to you. I promise you that. We will put you on the prayer list and we will pray for you every single day because that's what we do because we're a praying church. Secondly, tithes and offering. You know, an important part of being a Christian is giving your tithes and offerings to the Lord. And there are a number of scriptures that tell us why that is so important. But I'm here to tell you, we have made this so easy, so simple. Just go to our website and click on the tab that says support this ministry. It'll take you from there. It's so easy, even I could do it. So again, thanks for coming out today. And now here's this week's message. Good morning, everybody. I'm Deacon T, and I'm going to be bringing you the Word of God today. Welcome to Modern Word Ministries. This week's message is entitled, Dealing with Haters. And the title is pretty representative of, of what the subject is this week. But before we get into the, the actual text, I just wanted to talk about this phenomena or this uh, epidemic of, of hating. I, I didn't grow up um, in a world where we had electronics and media and Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and DM and PM. And I, I, I didn't have any of that. It was non-existent. And consequently, if you wanted to hate on somebody, or you wanted to bully on somebody, or you wanted to do something uh, mean, you either need to call them on the telephone, or you needed to do it to their face, which of course immediately revealed who it was that was doing this bad behavior. In today's world, in my opinion, it has become very easy to be a sniper hater. And a sniper hater to me is somebody who hides off in the, in the weeds, hides off in the tall grass of all this technology and this social media that's out there, and they make fake accounts, and they, they use fake names, and they use fake photos, and they have filters, and they do all this stuff, and they torment people, and they hate on people, and they lie on people, and they, 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 they mess with people's sanity, and they're calm, but they don't have the guts they don't have the intestinal fortitude. I was going to say something else, but it's, it's Sunday. But they, so, so they don't have the intestinal fortitude to bully in person, if you will. I don't understand that kind of behavior. And I was reading last week about this young person, um, like 12 or 13 years old, who, who ended up taking his own life. 
um, because he was bullied so badly by some other kids from his school. And it was all done anonymously, and it was all done uh, um, through social media, but it was vicious, and it was mean, and, and, and it was inaccurate, and it was just all these things. And, and reading about this and, and hearing his parents talk about the loss of their son to these sniper bullies made me start thinking about the Bible and haters in the Bible and people in the Bible who didn't do the right thing and certainly didn't follow the example that Jesus laid out, or if they were before Jesus, they didn't follow the rules that God had laid out. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing because it's so easy to get caught up in this group mindset. People, and maybe they've always been this way, people are weak. People are so weak that they can't stand their own ground and go against the crowd. I mean, I think of the the KKK, I think of these white supremacists, I, I think of these Antifa people, and they go out and they recruit the weakest, least backboned, most insecure people they can find to join in their terror of hate and their and their and their reign of hate and their reign of terror, is what I meant to say. And, and, and they get people who, quite frankly, can't stand on their own. And if it wasn't for being in this bigger group of KKK or white supremacists or whoever it is, if they weren't in that group, they'd be too afraid to do any bullying on their own. They'd be too afraid to do any, any terrorism on their own. And I'm using the word terrorism because in a minute I'm going to make a point. For the last several weeks, we have been besieged by terrorist activities around this world, and particularly in the Middle East. And we see people in coming out of Iran and Lebanon and Palestine who are, number one, attacking brutalizing, murdering, savagely torturing, raping women, children, and men who are not military combatants in the most horrible, egregious way many experts have ever seen. And forget about their reason why. Forget about what they think is justification for this behavior. These same people are so weak that when they time comes to, to go out and shoot at actual military enemies, they put women and children in front of themselves to act as flak jackets. And they allow women and children and old people to be shot in order to protect themselves when they have instituted this campaign of savagery and they call it military action. I, I think it's all cowardice and it's terrorism. It's not military. You know, hating started a long time ago. I, I don't know of any hating before this, so I'm going to talk about first here what God talks to us about and what Jesus represented. 
and then what the Bible says. Clearly, Jesus represents love at any cost. And that hating on others, with a few exceptions, is wrong. Don't be confused that that means you need to love everybody and allow people to abuse you, to hurt you, to hate you, to bully you. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that you're not to hate them. What it means is you're to love them as God loved you, which means in spite of your problems, in spite of your inappropriate behavior, in spite of what you've done, that you will love them. That doesn't mean you're going to interact with them. That doesn't mean you're inviting them over for coffee and cupcakes. It doesn't mean anything like that. Obviously not. I'm not suggesting you do that. But what I am suggesting is, is that hating back on them is not right, it's not appropriate, it's not biblical, it's not godly. That's what I'm suggesting. If we go to Genesis, in the fourth chapter, the eighth through the sixteenth verse, it's the story of Cain killing Abel. And I'm going to read this very quickly, and then we're going to come back to a couple of the verses and break them out for you. So in Genesis 4 and 8, it says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and they and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now, God is talking to to Cain. And now, you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. (coughs) Excuse me. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said, hmm. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now, I want to point a couple things out here. And this applies to you. I know it applies to me. People hate you for no reason. People hate on you because you're blessed. People hate on you because God blesses you, because God puts favor on your life. This is what's so strange, and I want you to read this Genesis 4 where it talks about why did Cain kill Abel? Does anybody know? Because, here's the reason, God took Abel's sacrifice and accepted it and said, yeah, this is a good sacrifice. But the sacrifice of Cain, he didn't accept and said, nah, this isn't a very good sacrifice. And it ticked off Cain that Abel was getting blessed, so he killed him. Abel did not do anything to Cain. 
I want you to think about the people in your life, in your life experience, who have or who are hating on you. And think about what you've done to them. I can tell you, for the most part, the people who have hated on me in my life, hated on me for other reasons. Hated on me for other reasons. It's not because I did something to them. That's the case here. So how crazy is this? People hate you because you're blessed. Here's what we don't know about these people who are blessed, who we might be hating on. You know what? Maybe they're praying. Maybe they have a better relationship with God because they're putting more work into it than us. Or maybe in this case, we're putting more work into it than they are. Guess what? When you have a closer relationship with someone, you're going to have more favor. I'm going to tell you about my own little story. And it's a, it's, it's a funny story because it's a family story. And family stories are always funny when you start to think about them. I'm the oldest of 10 children. And after my mother had passed away a number of years back, my siblings and I were all together, and one of them said, yeah, that's easy for you to say, Tom. You were always mom's favorite. She liked you more than she liked us. We know she loved us, but she liked you more than she liked us. You were always her favorite. Can I tell you something? I was her favorite. Absolutely. But do you know why I was her favorite? I'm going to tell you why, from where I sit, I was her favorite. Some of it is because of how I acted. Some of it was just because. I was her firstborn, and I was a male child. That gave me a few extra points, as it does to most firstborn male children with their mother. So that gave me a couple extra points. But here's the other reason. From the time I can remember, I never said no to my mother. I never engaged her in any back and forth disagreement. I never was a, was a disrespectful child or adult in any way to my mother. I called my mother on the telephone virtually every single day of my life from the time I moved out of the house. You may say, oh, that's absolutely crazy. That's not, uh, you're exaggerating. I'm going to tell you, sitting here on Sunday at church with God as my witness, I called my mother and over 35 years or something, I probably missed two handfuls of days that I didn't call her. She may not have been home. I might have left a message, but I called all the time. When my mother needed something, I tried to provide it for her. When one of my siblings needed something and my mother wanted to help them, I tried to help her with that. When my mother struggled with my father, who was a crazy spouse, crazy person, not a good guy. I helped her. So, shocking, I am my mom's favorite. But my mother and I spent more time together and put more into our relationship than any of my other siblings. Not taking anything away from them. It's just how it worked out between my mother and me. It's the same in your relationship with God. I don't need to be mad at you. Because you have a better relationship with God. I need to look in the mirror and get myself together. Mr. Cain. Mr. Cain was mad because Abel and God had a better relationship. So instead of cleaning up his own act, he killed his brother. The ultimate act of hatred 
And his brother had done nothing, nothing to him. How about this, though? If this isn't telling you about God's love, I don't know what is. When Cain pled his case back to God and said, this punishment is greater than I can bear. Everybody will try to kill me. God still loved him so much that he backed up a little bit from his original punishment and said, you know what? You're right. So I'm going to put a mark on you so that that won't happen to you. And he let him go ahead and settle in land and raise his own crew, his own tribe of people. Wow. Well, mm. Mm. in 1 John, and I'm going to come back to these notes. In, in 1 John 3 and 11, this is just so amazing. It says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life. This is spiritual death they're talking about here. Because we love the brothers Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, I'm just going to repeat that. But this, the premise of loving people is so powerful. That what he's saying, John is saying here is, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Ooh. Ooh. And of course, murderers have no eternal life in them. In other words, you ain't going to heaven, bro. Wow. So how should it be then? Well, what 1 John goes on to say in 4 and 19 is, we love, meaning you and me, because he, meaning God, first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him meaning from God, whomever loves God must also love his brother. Do you notice it doesn't say unless you have a real estate dispute? You see, that that's what they have in the Middle East. Understand that. Thousands of years old, but a real estate dispute. Who owns this land? Who owns these little towns? who can stay here, so forth and so on. Whoever does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God. Wow. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. It doesn't say Muslim. It doesn't say Shiite. It doesn't say Christian. It doesn't say Jew. There's no religions in here. It doesn't say Palestinian. It doesn't say Syrian. It doesn't say Israeli. There's no national origin in here. It doesn't say male. It doesn't say female. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. So, 
Here's what I'm curious about, or I was curious about. Is there any time when it's okay to hate? I mean, think about this for a minute. If someone murdered your family, tortured your mother-in-law, your I, I saw somebody on TV whose mother-in-law and his daughter, who was 13, were raped and murdered, and his wife was abducted and has not been found. And they and they are pretty sure what has happened to her, but they they, they, they have not recovered her body. Is it okay to hate those people? They, they they broke into my house in the middle of the night, into this guy's house, beat him unconscious, left him for dead, stole his mother-in-law and his daughter and wife, and murdered them savagely, brutally, raped and murdered them. I wondered that. So I looked in Psalm. Psalms 97 and 10. O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of the saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Hmm. Hmm. But then, how am I, because I just don't understand. I really didn't. How am I supposed to hate evil if I have to love all my brethren? If one of my brethren came into my house and wiped out my family, Isn't that person evil? Isn't that person overcome with evil? And the answer is, in my opinion, the person himself, in his core, is still God's child. What he's doing is evil. He himself is still a child of God and we are required to love him as God loved us. God still punished people. Let's not be confused. God punished plenty of people. But he always loved people and that's why he punished them to get them to change their ways and to act like he has told us we need to act. In Proverbs 8 and 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech, I hate. So it's okay to hate evil. It's okay to hate perverted speech. Perverted speech would be speech that's against the ways of God. Right? Again, not the person, but the speech. In Romans, and then I'm going to get to six things that God hates. In Romans 12 and 17 down to 20, it says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. In other words, you don't pay back evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it is possible, this is, this is, here it is, this is the whole hook to everything I want to tell you today. If it's possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. 
Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Woohoo! What's the two things in there that just pop me on my head? First, this one. If it is possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Okay, that does not mean. You have to stand there and let somebody kill you and you cannot fight back. He sent David. He sent Solomon. He sent all of the kings and the rulers over all these tribes. He sent out year after year after year on war missions. God ordained them to go out and, and massacre and slaughter people who God wanted handled. It's throughout the Bible. Because he was ridding the land of evil and ridding the land of people who refuse to act in a godly manner. And he was using earthly angels on his behalf to do that. But what does it say here? This is the part here. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. Because when you do that, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. What does that mean anyway? What that means is, when you're kind to your enemy, what can he possibly do? You're going to put coals of fire on his head? What does that mean? You're going to burn up his hatred. You're going to take that evil inside of you and, and your kindness and your love, your compassion, your humanity is going to override his animal characteristics. His evil. Because good will overcome evil. Wow. Overcome evil with good. You don't overcome evil with evil. Wow. If we move to Proverbs. Hmm. Let me do Malachi first. Malachi 1 and 12. So my question was, I had the, you know, you know, I put these messages together. I, I have more questions probably than anybody. I've got, my, my, my wife would tell you, I have pads of notes that are questions. Oh, what about this? I wonder about that. I wonder about that. And then I go back every once in a while and I'll just start researching them and, and seeing if I can find answers. So I said, did God ever hate anybody? Did God ever hate anybody that we can prove? Not, oh, he let them get burnt up or he let them drown or, you know. Like, I couldn't find anywhere, for instance, you know, when Moses got to the Red Sea and the Egyptians were following him and the Red Sea parted for Moses and then it collapsed on all the uh, uh, Egyptians. I couldn't find anywhere where it said God hated them. He just didn't want him to get Moses. In Malachi 1 and 2, I'm just reading what it says in the English Standard Version. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. So God, because of how Esau acted, God, not me. God says, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Hmm. So in Proverbs 6 and 16, I'm not going to even get it, get into that Malachi because it is what it is. Proverbs 6 and 16. There are, I'm reading this now. You, you might want to look this up. 
there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Ready? Haughty eyes. Those are people you know holier than now looking down on people. Snooty, snotty, whatever you want to call them, right? A lying tongue. Everybody knows what that is. Hands that shed innocent blood. Think about the Middle East right now. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. And lastly, you're going to want to turn off your uh, social media when I say this. And one who sows discord among brothers. Okay, I'm going to repeat them. These are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that he sees as an abomination unto him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord amongst the brothers. I've done some of that. I haven't shed innocent blood. I've done some lying. I've done some looking down on people. I had some plans that weren't all that great. I probably ran too evil. Do you ever notice evil looks really good? Why is that? I, I said it last week. Why is it evil always has a great figure with a short skirt? And right, and long good hair and light eyes. Why is that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm being funny. Don't send me any hate notes. A false witness who breathes out lies. We've all done that. And one who sows discord among the brothers. Now, I don't know that I've ever done that, but we all know we have seen, we have witnessed, or we have experienced. I hope we haven't done it people who have used social media to put out lies about people to hide the truth or to stir up trouble for no reason on earth. And I'm going to tell you, I, I have never been in my life less proud of the people who run our government. This isn't a political statement. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. The entire bunch of people who seem to be in Washington, D.C. recently and now seem to bear false witness a lot. They sow discord a lot. They have lying tongues. They're devising wicked plans. I'm just saying, this is not a political statement. Do not write to me or call me and tell me, blah, blah, blah. I'm not talking about anybody. I'm talking about everybody. That's a rough way to be. It's a rough way to be. You see, God wants us to forgive each other for screwing up. Because here's the thing. Some of us may screw up differently than others, but we all screw up. God said sin is sin. So if you cheat on your income tax or you, you, you know, stole something out of the store that was worth $10. It's a sin just like murdering somebody or taking an innocent life or raping and pillaging. Now, we don't like to hear that, okay? 
So I just want to ask you, I'm asking you in the context of what God is asking us here. Yes, we should condemn these kind of behaviors. Yes, we should condemn this terrorist stuff that's going on now and these murder of innocent women and children and old people. A hundred percent. But don't do it to your own demise. Use it as a time to look at what's going on in your own life. What are your own behaviors? What things are you doing? What are you doing to others? How are you treating others? You know, are you a good person? Do you take care of things? Do you look out for your neighbor? Do you provide food and beverage for your enemies, which then diffuses them from being your enemy? Or do you pay back? Payback. The big payback, as James Brown would say, huh? I'm here to tell you, we as people on this earth, but starting as Christians, we have a higher duty because you see, we know. And if you didn't know, now you know because I just told you. We have a duty to set an example of how we should be. We have a duty. I'm not saying you don't fight back a terrorist attack. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about individually, personally, how we live our lives. We need to do a better job. I need to do a better job. I need to do a better job with how I live. This message was so eye-opening to me you can hate me because I'm more blessed than you. Ain't nothing I can do about that. All I can say is, love you, man. That's all I can do. That's what God wants you to do. You see, here's something that a lot of us forget. Here's something that I personally am proud of. And you don't hear me talk like this too often. I am really proud to say to you, or to say to you, or you, or you, or whoever the haters out there are, whoever they are, I'm not the person I was when you met me. I'm not the same guy I was. 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And I don't mean just because I'm not selling drugs or collecting money or doing other things that I used to do. I don't mean that part of it. I'm talking about inside here. I'm not the same person I was back then. And I pray every day that I'm not the same person I was when you met me. That every day I'm working on being a better manifestation of myself, being a better person, doing more with what God gave me, and trying to be more like the example he lays out for us in these scriptures, and more like Jesus was when he was here. I'm not talking about being a fool and let people run over me or you. I'm not talking about being best buddies with people who want to hurt you. I'm not talking about being a pacifist. I'm talking about differentiating between evil behavior and evil people. I'm talking about winning over evil whenever possible. 
with love. I'm talking about when you can't win people over. Continue to love them, but stay away from them. Pray for them. Pray for them that they see the light, that they become more like him. Not that they become more like you or me. And pray that we can stay strong, you and I. And not go to the dark side and invoke evil on them for the evil they did to you. Some people deserve punishment. God will ordain that. God will tell us what we should do if we listen. I'm not suggesting that some people don't deserve the punishment they get. But you can give punishment out of love just as easily as out of hate. That's why I call this thing dealing with haters. It's really about how do you and I respond, not how they respond. You see, I can't change them. Only God can change them. Only they can change themselves with God's help. But I can pray that they would see the light and want to do the right thing. Rather than taking it upon myself to meet evil with more evil. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to come out here this week. We thank you for all the love and the care and the compassion you showed toward us, even toward Cain after he killed his brother. We thank you for, for loving on us when we don't even love ourselves. We thank you for giving us models to follow and, 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 and diagrams and outlines in your word to lead us to appropriate behavior when we are met with inappropriate behavior. Give us strength and courage and wisdom, Lord, that we might be able to decipher these situations and that with your help, with your grace, your mercy, and your favor, we would meet evil with love, that we would meet hatred with compassion and even more love, that we would, through our prayers and our actions, turn people's minds and therefore turn their actions that they too would be more like you and more like your son Jesus. We ask you to bless us. We ask you to bring peace in this world. We ask you to eliminate the threats to peace. And we ask you to never ever let go of your love and hold that you have on us. We ask this in all things, in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, and all God's people said amen. Well, I want to thank you for coming out this week, for being here. I'm going to be here next week. I want you to be here. I want you to be here with us. I got a message already working on that, that, that is going to, to dovetail on this, and, and I think it's going to make a lot of sense. Um, 10 a.m. every Sunday, modernwordministries.org. Remember, there's two things you can count on. God's going to see you through, and I'm going to pray for you. So until next week, just remember, this is Modern Word Ministries, where you can come as you are, but you'll never leave the same. Until then, be safe, be happy, pray for peace in the Middle East and throughout the world. I love you all. I can't wait to see you. Have a blessed, blessed week. Bye-bye, everybody.